Hey folks, welcome to lecture 10. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the seed plants and the gymnosperms. It's really important that you pay attention to the first part of the lecture, which focuses broadly on the seed plants. That's gonna set you up to understand the angiosperms, which we'll cover later in the week. I'm pretty proud of the two field trips that I take you on during this uh, lecture. I'm going to first take you to the Tall Trees Grove in Redwoods National Park, and then later on show you my adventure in the Bristlecone Pine Forest. So stay tuned and let's get started. In order to better understand the gymnosperms, we need to first focus on the shared characteristics of seed plants. Gymnosperms and angiosperms are collectively referred to as the seed plants. If you look at this phylogeny, you can see that the gymnosperms and angiosperms are each other's closest relatives, and they in turn are more closely related to the manilophytes. But remember that manilophytes don't make seeds. Only gymnosperms and angiosperms make seeds. Seed plants share several important innovations, all of which we've talked about before. They are seeds, pollen, secondary growth, and heterospory. Within the seed plants, two characteristics should really stand out to you. Those are seeds and pollen. What I'd like you to do is take a moment to consider why seeds and pollen are such important innovations among land plants. What are the advantages of both seeds and pollen? Let's move on to some common features of reproduction in seed plants. Since this lecture is focused on the gymnosperms, let's have a look at a phylogeny that shows the different gymnosperm groups. Gymnosperms include cycads, ginkgo, neophytes, and conifers. One really important feature is to know that seeds of gymnosperms are not surrounded by fruit. Gymnos means naked, so gymnosperms refers to naked seeds. This means their seeds are not surrounded by any kind of fleshy, fleshy covering. In contrast, the angiosperm seeds are surrounded by fruit. That fruit, as we learned before, is the product of a ripened ovary. One feature that does stand out among gymnosperms is cones. Recall that we've talked about cones before. Cones, or stroboli, are stacked clusters of sporangia. In gymnosperms, most notably the conifers, the female cones tend to be large and woody, and the male cones tend to be soft and kind of squishy. Female cones produce seeds, and the male cones produce pollen. For that reason, the male cones are often referred to as pollen cones. These cones can vary in size. So for example, in California, we have the longest cone, which is a sugar pine cone that can get over one foot in length. The smallest cone is the Canadian hemlock. It's really small, less than a quarter inch long. And then we have the bunya pine cones. If you recall from our previous lecture, bunya pine cones belong to the group that you would call monkey puzzle trees, the oracarias, and they can get absolutely massive sometimes more than 20 pounds and be as large as like a basketball. So imagine in some places you that you find these trees, for example, in New Zealand and Australia, there are signs that warn you, be careful, these are really heavy and could definitely kill you if you're not paying attention. One thing that's really important to think about when you think about seed plants is that we have yet another shift regarding the spores. So remember that spores are those structures because they're coated in sporopollenin that are ideal for dispersal. And the sporangia are the structures that produce spores. In seed plants, the sporangia are actually protected by layers of the sporophyte tissue called the integuments. So because the sporangia are actually enclosed by these integuments, the spores can never leave. This sort of creates a problem. So the spores are the primary mechanism of dispersal in land plants until we've got to seed plants here. And now I'm telling you that the sporangia are wrapped up in these integuments. So 
In seed plants, the spores can never leave the parent plant. If you look at the figure on the left here, you can see an example of a megasporangium. Remember, all seed plants are heterosporous, so the megasporangium would produce the megaspore. And it's surrounded by a layer of tissue, which we call the integument layers. On the right-hand side, in this cross-section of a cone, a female cone, you can see that we have this megasporangium surrounded by the integument layer. So there's no real way for those spores to actually leave. So we have to solve this problem of dispersal in another way. The solution to that problem is actually pollen. So pollen is something that transfers sperm directly to the egg. Now in previous lectures we talked about how pollen is actually the microgametophyte. It is that structure that produces the sperm and as such is coated in sporopollenin because it develops from microspores. So pollen has the benefits of spores in that they're not going to be susceptible to any kind of desiccation, but they also have the advantage of delivering sperm directly to the egg using a structure called a pollen tube. But pollen's not a spore, nor is pollen flying plant sperm, it's actually the microgametophyte. In this image, you can see a pollen grain up close, and coming off of it is that pollen tube. If you have a look at the megasporangium of a gymnosperm, here would be the integument layers. The pollen grain is here, and it grows very slowly a pollen tube that goes all the way inside the megasporangium of the a female cone, eventually making its way to the archegonium where there is an egg. And what happens is the pollen tube actually digests away all of this tissue. And in some gymnosperms, this can take a very long time, sometimes up to a year. Recall that gymnosperm seeds are not enclosed by fruit. We have a megasporangium, which makes a megaspore, Remember that spores divide mitotically and grow into gametophytes. So eventually this megaspore will grow into a gametophyte. That is surrounded by the integument layers. Pollen grains eventually make their way towards the micropyle and a pollen tube grows through the micropyle to deliver sperm directly to the egg. If you look at something like the seed, if I overlay the seed of a gymnosperm on this megasporangium, you see that the integument layers are there and those eventually form the seed coat, but there are no fruit. One reason for this is that gymnosperms lack ovaries. Remember that the fruit of angiosperms is the product of a ripened ovary. If we have a closer look at a gymnosperm seed, you can see we have a seed coat. We have nutritive tissue, which is the remains of the megagametophyte and is thus haploid. And then we have an embryo. There's no fruit. And again, that nutritive tissue is not triploid as it is in angiosperms. It's not the product of double fertilization. It's the leftover remains of the haploid megagametophyte. I think it's important that we take a moment to kind of reflect on the kinds of changes that have happened in the life cycles of land plants. Particularly, I want you to think about the changing role of the spore and the gametes. So if we go back and we think once again about our moss, remember that we have a gametophyte dominant body with an attached and nutritionally dependent sporophyte. If I take another example, we're gonna go to the ferns. Now we have kind of a shift, right? Because ferns are vascular plants, we now have a sporophyte dominant body, 
and now the gametophyte is a small independently living heart-shaped structure that has archegonia and antheridia. So in this case, and the, well, let, let's step back and just say in these both of these cases, we have spores as the primary mechanism of dispersal so that the spores actually end up leaving the sporangia of the moss. So if I were to redraw it very quickly, Remember the sporangia split, and then we have the release of spores that eventually land somewhere and grow into new gametophytes. Similarly with ferns, we have those structures on the undersurfaces of their leaves called sori, and again, they are releasing spores, and the spores eventually fall onto the ground and grow into gametophytes. And so the real kicker here is that when you get to something that's a seed plant, the role of spores is totally different. And so if you recall from our previous lectures, seed plants are all heterosporous. That means that we have a sporophyte, that's diploid and the sporophyte doesn't make just one it makes two sizes of spores it makes microspores and it makes megaspores now both these structures are haploid and they grow eventually into two different gametophytes microspores grow into microgametophytes and megaspores grow into megagametophytes. Remember, microgametophytes and megagametophytes are each specialized to produce a certain kind of gamete. So microgametophytes make sperm, megagametophytes make eggs, and you know the rest. And so the question then becomes, when you're looking at seed plants, where are these structures? Well, remember, seed plants, again, are all heterosporous. And so they have one sporophyte, that's the thing that you see that you call the plant. Like if you look at a pine tree, that pine tree is the sporophyte. Where are the microspores and megaspores? And if you look internally, what you see is that there are sporangia so places where spores are produced And inside of that, for example, would be like a mega sporangium. And remember, because the sporophyte makes spores by meiosis, meiosis happens in here, and you end up with one megaspore. And that megaspore goes on to do some more complicated things that we're not going to really pay attention to. But the key detail here is that the sporangium itself is surrounded by integument layers. And these integument layers enclose the sporangium such that the spores never leave the parent plant. So we have a shift. And that shift is no longer are spores the primary mechanism of dispersal. Spores grow in place into two different structures. One would be a megagametophyte, where we would eventually find the egg. And two is a microgametophyte. 
And the microgametophyte in seed plants is important to note because that is pollen grain. So pollen is the microgametophyte. And so we've kind of changed the role of spores, but we've also shifted sperm delivery. So remember, in moss, sperm require water to swim to meet the egg. In ferns, in lycophytes, same thing. We have to have water. But once we get to seed plants, the pollen delivers sperm directly to the egg, no longer requiring water. And so in many ways, this is a little bit more efficient to have the gametophytes flying around. So in the case of gymnosperms, for example, they're wind, most of them are wind pollinated. So these microgametophytes, the pollen grains, can fly around and make themselves um, deliver sperm directly to that egg. In something like an angiosperm, a flowering plant, this is even more efficient because the ones that are pollinated by insects, you have increased specificity. So I'd like you to make sure you understand the, the change in the role of spores in gametes in some kind of example like I've shown you here. Let's move on and focus on some of the diversity within gymnosperms. We'll start with the cycads. If you reflect back on the previous lecture, you remember our little field trip where I took you to the front of Storer Hall. There were lots of cycads there. So cycads are characterized by having large compound leaves and they have separate male and female plants. Whenever you have separate male and female plants, this is called dioecious. If you look at the leaves of a cycad, they're very characteristic. You would call them compound, somewhat resembling a fern, but if you ever were to feel a cycad leaf, it definitely feels much tougher and stiffer than most ferns. And recall that they produce large cones. The cones are different depending on the sex of the actual plant. There are male cones and there are female cones, just like you would find in a conifer, like a pine tree. Most gymnosperms are actually pollinated by wind. You can definitely know this if you ever go outside and see your car covered in the pollen dust of something like pine trees. Cycads, in contrast, are the only gymnosperms that are pollinated by insects. So one cool example of this is this cycad pollinating beetle and these thrips. Now the thrips are really interesting because during certain times of the day, the cycad cone becomes very attractive to the thrips. The thrips crawl all over the male cone, get coated in pollen, and then switch over to the female cone and deliver pollen to that female cone where the eggs can eventually be fertilized. Many people think that cycads kind of have a prehistoric look to them. And so for that reason, they're oftentimes referred to as dinosaur plants. This is partly because they were among the dominant part of the flora when dinosaurs were really abundant, like in the Jurassic. And so there are great examples of cycad fossils from 150 to 200 million years ago, and they closely resemble the plants that you see today. If you look at the global distribution of cycads, you can see that they're distributed worldwide, but in many places they are threatened or endangered. This is partly due to development, but it's also due to the fact that many people like to collect cycad species. So in some places, cycads are threatened in addition to development, but also because of pressure from collectors. And so for that reason, many species have a really endangered conservation status. This is partly because their cones are really large and can be quite beautiful, but many species are actually super toxic, not unlike ferns. So definitely you would not want to eat a cycad. Let's next talk about ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba is the last surviving member of a once more diverse and widespread lineage. So historically, in the deep past, what you had were gink many ginkgo species living at the same time. 
If you look at some fossil ginkgo, you can see that their leaves actually closely resemble the leaves of modern ginkgo. So they haven't changed very much even over many millions of years. Now today, there's only one species of ginkgo. It's the last surviving member of this once more diverse lineage. Now it's called ginkgo biloba because the leaves are actually divided into two lobes. If you look at this ginkgo, you can see one lobe is going here to the right and one here is going to the left. Ginkgo powder is sold as a traditional medicine to improve memory. It has over 1,500 year history of use and in some places there are ginkgos that are highly revered. So this is a temple in China and you can see during the fall when the ginkgo leaves change color, it gets absolutely amazing, this beautiful gold color and people come from all around to have a look at the beautiful tree. Similar to the other gymnosperms that we've talked about, ginkgo plants are dioecious, so there are separate male and female plants. One thing that's unusual about ginkgo is if you look at the different uh, sexes of plants, um, you can see that the cones are pretty indistinct. They don't look a lot like the big woody cones that you would recognize in, say, a conifer. Their sperm are still motile. That means the sperm still swim through water in order to reach the egg. However, one really, really interesting thing is that the seeds of ginkgo end up being coated in a fleshy covering. But remember, because gymnosperms don't have ovaries, this is the product of a different layer of tissue. Now, this layer of tissue is really notable because it oftentimes smells really, really, really bad. So a couple things in review here. There are separate sexes of plants. The sperm, despite there being pollen, the pollen goes um, again to the female cone, but then has to swim a short distance to reach the egg. And ultimately this stinky fruit is produced um, that's surrounding the seeds of ginkgo. We always say stinko ginkgo for that reason. Ginkgo trees are really beautiful and so they're you know prized to be put into gardens and other places for decorative purposes, um, primarily because when they change color, their leaves are really beautiful. But it tends to be the case that the female trees are not planted and this is done in order to avoid that stinky fruit. But on our campus, many of the ginkgo trees that you see are actually female, and so you can go up during certain times of the year and have a smell. It has a really distinctive smell. Some people think it smells sort of like dog poop. Other people don't think it smells like that at all. And there are some people that actually even eat the flesh of the ginkgo seeds. Let's move on to the neophytes. The neophytes are a really small group that only includes three different genera. One are Welwichia, two is Ephedra, and three is Needham. Perhaps the most spectacular of the neophytes is Welwichia. Welwichia occurs in the fog deserts of Namibia and Angola. And so what happens is during certain times of the day, a fog sort of belt rolls in, not unlike you would find in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the Welwichia use this moisture to give themselves water. They're also known to have extremely deep tap roots, and so they use this water to keep them sustained. Now, again, this is a plant that has separate male and female sexes, and one thing that's really interesting about Welwichia is that they have a meristematic tissue attached to their leaves such that their leaves have indeterminate growth. So in most cases, leaves have determinate growth. They only get so big. We saw one exception of this in the ZZ plant. Remember the ZZ plant, which is an angiosperm, has some meristematic tissue on its leaves, but in Welwichia, these leaves tend to grow throughout the entire lives. Now they can kind of get scraggly looking and they split apart, not unlike the split ends of growing human hair, but you get the idea. The leaves continue to grow and they're just one example of a leaf that has indeterminate growth. The last neophyte I'll tell you about are ephedra. 
Ephedra are widespread and prefer sandy soils, usually in dry desert-like environments. And the interesting thing about them is that they have a history of being used as a stimulant. So this is what is used to make the so-called Mormon tea, and also, at least initially, was the natural product for the drug ephedrine. So ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are now made synthetically, but these drugs were derived from ephedra. If you look at ephedra, you can see that the leaves are very reduced, so they almost have no leaves. Uh, again, not dissimilar from what we see in Silotum, and their cones look very different than any other kind of conifer or gymnosperm that you can think of. They are not woody and tend to be very small. Let's finish with the conifers. Conifers by far form the most diverse gymnosperm lineage. There is over a thousand species of conifers, and some of them are really, really important economically. So for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a large tract of forest that pretty much circumnavigates the globe. You can see it highlighted in light green here, and this is known as the boreal forest biome. The boreal forest biome is not only super important to um, human society for its economic importance, but it's also home to many, many diverse species. One of the features that stands out among conifers are their modified leaves. So if you think about a conifer like a pine tree, the pine needles should really stand out to you as highly modified leaves. And so when you think about a pine needle and you take a cross section of it, among the things that you notice is that there are first waxy buildups on the outside of the leaves that prevent desiccation. And there's also lots of resin ducts which produce a sap to make them distasteful to herbivores. Now it, the pine needle itself is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, when you think about a needle shape, it doesn't seem like it would be very efficient for photosynthesis, but because they oftentimes occur in big clusters, the total surface area of all of those needles is actually enough to make them uh, very efficient photosynthetically. Another thing that's interesting about them is that the needles themselves can be very long lived. So pine needles, for example, can be between three and five years. And as we'll soon see some of the other species of conifers, it can be significantly older than that. So the shape of the leaf is also uh, adapted to kind of prevent large clops of snow from accumulating um, on especially young trees. The older trees can actually take the snow, and you can see in this image here that there are you know, permanent clumps of snow that have accumulated on the leaves, but eventually that will slide off. It's not like a large surface area of something like a maple leaf, which would readily f freeze. So the needles of the pines are modified uh, and to help them be better adapted to cold environments. California is actually an amazing place for the diversity of conifers, and three of these trees really stand out. They stand out because they're relictual lineages. When I say relictual, I mean that there are no geographically close relatives for that species. These include the giant redwood, which lives in the Sierra Nevada, the coast redwood, which lives along the west coast, and the bristlecone pine, which occurs in the southeastern Sierra and also in Nevada and to other states, but we still have them in California. The giant redwood is the most massive tree, the coast redwood is the tallest tree, and the bristlecone pine tree is the oldest tree. Coast redwood trees really stand out in California, not only because they're the tallest trees in the world, but because our state has large tracts of primary growth redwood forest. When I say primary growth, I mean that, that that forest stand has no history of logging. And the tallest redwood tree that we know of right now is about 380 feet tall. If you look at the far left, you can see a map of where those primary groves are located. Muir Woods is probably the closest and is just north of the San Francisco Bay Area. And then you get into kind of an extended tract that forms Redwood National Parks 
that's comprised of a number of smaller state parks, including that place Fern Canyon that I showed you earlier. There's really no substitute for walking around in a primary growth redwood tree, and I would highly encourage everybody in the class to take some time to go and walk around in these groves. Especially if you're from California, these redwood groves really par form part of our heritage. There is a long um, struggle and uh, really interesting environmental story that deals with the protection of these primary grove redwood forests. And it wasn't too long ago that the state of California purchased among the last privately owned redwood um, groves in the state. As I showed you in the conservatory, the closest living relatives of coast redwood trees are the dawn redwood trees in China. So if you look at this map here, you can see that we have a small patch of living coast redwood trees. That's what I just showed you. And its closest living relative is Meta Sequoia, which occurs all the way in China. So again, this fits our definition of a relic species. If you look at the um, Meta Sequoia in China, the Dawn Redwood trees, several things stand out. One, the leaves look really similar to the coast redwood trees for sure, but they're actually a deciduous tree. So that means that in the fall, they actually shed their leaves. If you look at the fossil history of these species, you can see that they were formerly very widespread. Both Sequoia and the Meta Sequoia had a nearly global distribution. And when you look at the fossils, you can see that the leaves look very much like the ones that we see today. Now the Meta Sequoia in China has an amazing story as they were thought to be extinct. But in 1944, a small pocket of Meta Sequoia were discovered and then eventually studied in 1946 after World War II. Hey folks, so today I have the privilege of being in Humboldt Redwood State Park and I'm here in the Tall Trees Grove. Now the Tall Trees Grove is at the very base of a deep valley. Uh, it's actually an alluvial plain of Redwood Creek. And so this is a place where some of the tallest trees in the world are known to occur. So the tree behind me is called the Libby tree, and at one time this was recognized as the tallest tree in the world with a height of nearly 360 feet. Now since then, there have been some taller trees discovered, but they're not that much taller, maybe up to 380 and, and change feet. And so this is a really tall tree. So remember, one of the things I wanted to remind you of is, first of all, redwood trees. This species occurs only in a limited place in the United States, it occurs in the Western United States, uh, and notably in areas where there is a fog belt. So redwood trees have very shallow roots and they rely on fog moisture to provide them with most of their water. Now the closest living relatives of redwood trees are dawn redwood trees, which are in China. And redwood trees, therefore, we recognize as something called, called a relictual species. So this is a species for which there are no geographically close living relatives. And last, of course, is this idea that uh, all, a lot of uh, redwood groves um, are not really primary growth. They're not old growth redwoods. But up in Northern California, we have concentrations of old growth or primary growth redwoods, which have not ever been logged. And so this is an example of an area that has not been logged. And once again, behind me is the Libby tree. In addition to their significance commercially as lumber, some gymnosperm species are important in terms of medicines the most famous of which is Pacific yew. So Pacific yew is a gymnosperm, which not unlike ginkgo, produces a fleshy coating around its seat, that's the red part that you see here, and has a patchy geographic distribution that extends from Northern California all the way up through to Alaska. And so these trees actually tend to prefer kind of a real shady environment. They're oftentimes uh, an understory kind of plant which prefers that you know very shady cool moist environment their bark you can see is oftentimes covered in mosses when you feel a pacific yew tree the bark actually feels a little bit squishy and so one important um, drug that has come from gymnosperms is taxol. This is derived from the Pacific yew tree and is found to be a treatment for some kinds of cancers. Now when this was originally discovered, 
there was a big effort to sort of figure out how sustainable it could be to commercially grow Pacific U. But the problem is, is like other gymnosperms, they're very slow growing. And so it takes a lot of Pacific U material to produce taxol, which is a secondary metabolite of the plant that can be used for treating cancer. So nowadays it's actually all synthetically produced. And I'll provide a link to a really interesting interview that I did with Professor Philip Zerbe of the Department of Plant Biology, who has had some experience working with this really cool drug. The next group of trees I want to tell you about are the bristlecone pines. And in contrast to the coast redwoods, which are the tallest known trees in the world, and the giant redwoods, which are the most massive trees uh, known in the world, these trees are the oldest known non-clonal organisms on Earth. So that means they're the oldest sexually reproducing organisms that are known. And many of them are over 5,000 years old. Now, uh, if you look at these trees, one thing you'll notice is that they're oftentimes super twisted. The bark looks a little bit sheared off and they don't look exactly healthy and thriving. Now, this is because they live in really extreme environments. So these bristlecone pines typically live at very high elevation where moisture is low and soil quality is actually poor. It's really dry and exposed, especially during the hot months of summer. And so uh, another thing I'll point out to you is that uh, some of the needles even on a bristlecone pine tree can be very old, over 45 years old. And there's a really famous uh, story that goes with the tree called the Prometheus tree, which I think you should have a look online about where somebody actually cut this tree down. And this is one of the things that happened when people discovered uh, just how old these trees are. It was a little, it was already kind of known that they were very old, but um, when you get, you know, a tree cut down like this, there tends to be a lot of outcry and people reacted pretty strongly to this um, happening. Uh, now I'm gonna decide to uh, take you there now. So let's uh, take a field trip and go have a look at the bristlecone pine forest. Okay, folks, here we go. Off to go see the trees. It's five o'clock in the morning. I got my cup of coffee and we're ready for the drive. I thought I'd show you how we made our way to the ancient bristlecone pine forest. Um, we're starting here in Davis, of course, and going over 80, we get to 50. And this is really the best way is to go south of Lake Tahoe and then make your way to Highway 395. Once you're at 395, you can go south and you pass by some really cool scenery and amazing little towns. So I'm gonna zoom in here real quick. One of my favorite little towns on 395 is the town of Levining. This is where you find Mono Lake. Um, Mono Lake uh, is a really spectacular site all to itself. And you can continue down south all the way to the town of Bishop. Now, once you're at Bishop, um, you start to see signs that lead you to the town of Big Pine, where you get the turnoff to the ancient Brusicum Pine Forest. Now, if you have really extreme, um, you know, hardcore 4 by 4 interests, there are routes that lead you from Bishop to the ancient Brusicum Pine Forest, but we chose um, a little bit more moderate route from the town of Big Pine, and you can see this road start here. Now, I'll zoom in here real quick. And you can see that this road sort of winds along and it's paved all the way up to the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest Visitor Center, which is called the Shulman Grove. So here you can pretty easily make it and it's like sort of normal passenger car. But beyond that, uh, it starts to get a little bit more sketchy. Now this is a dirt road that'll take you all the way up to the Patriarch Grove which is where you will find the patriarch tree, which is the largest known bristlecone pine forest. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the adventure that we had in trying to get to see the patriarch tree. Um, but just to like reiterate this, the main part, this Shulman Grove, is pretty easily accessible in a normal passenger car. But beyond that, it starts to get a little tricky 
and uh, would really only be recommended for people that have lots of um, you know, four by four experience. So this is your warning, just in case that you are interested in going to have your own visit. As you make your way up that really windy what road towards the Shulman Grove, one thing I'll point out to you is that you get spectacular views of the Sierra Nevada. So here's some drone footage, which shows you the uh, east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And hopefully you remember from things like BizTube um, or other courses or other reading that you've done that um, the east side is really very different than the west. So you are sort of in this rain shadow um, effect. And so this is where you find a lot drier conditions. The soil conditions are typically pretty poor. Um, and the elevation where we are, which is in the White Mountains, is actually quite high. And so this is really the only place where you're going to find these bristlecone pines. And as you uh, go towards the grove on this windy road, the vegetation sharply changes and you start to see actually a lot less um, diversity in terms of conifers. Um, what you start seeing as you get higher really are only those uh, bristlecone pines. And so let's go have a look at what the route actually looks like. Okay, folks, here we are approaching the entrance to the ancient bristlecone pine forest. It's been a long trek, but we are almost there. All right, so here's where things get interesting. We decided that the best thing to do would be to first go to the Patriarch Grove, and then we'll come and visit the Shulman Grove on the way down. And so as we were driving on the dirt road leading to the Patriarch Grove, we were less than a mile away. Um, we saw a little snow patch and we thought, well, that doesn't look too terribly deep. And we went out and we tested it and we thought we could make it. But you guessed it, we ended up getting stuck in this snow patch that ended up being about three feet deep. And so we were unable to get out. Now, fortunately, somebody pulled up behind us with the intent of going up to the Patriarch Grove, and they pulled up in a little electric car. Now, this electric car was actually quite fancy and owned by a professor from Stanford. And so even though it kind of shames us that a Stanford professor ended up rescuing us, well, the Stanford professor hooked up a tow line and was able to drag our truck out of that snowbank. But I just want to be clear, that professor from Stanford had full intentions of going through that snowbank, and they would have been stuck too. So we were sort of the you know, first to go up, um, and I will try to save a little bit of face by saying we were brave enough to try that snowbank first. Either way, we had to turn around and go back down to the Shulman Grove. Okay, folks, here we are at the ancient bristlecone pine forest, and I'm about ready to walk on the Discovery Trail and show you some great trees. Let's go. Hey folks, I'm so excited today to make sure that I'm able to bring you to the ancient bristlecone pine forest. It was quite an adventure getting here. We had a little trouble with snow on the way, but we finally made it. Now, one thing I'll point out to you is that these trees, which is one of the special gymnosperms that I'm going to talk about this quarter, um, actually only occur at really high elevations. So right now, we're actually at 10,100 feet or so, and that's where the visitor center is. So right now, I'm at a place called the Shulman Grove, and I'm on the Discovery Trail. And as you walk along the trail, you see a lot of bristlecone pine, just like uh, the one here on my left. And as I walk through the trail, I'm going to show you some other examples. Now, bristlecone pines are most famous because of their great age. And this is that's something that was discovered when people started doing small coring sections of bristlecone pine trees. And the oldest tree that's known in this grove is, I think, 4,782 years old, so just shy of 5,000 years. Now, one of the people that was involved in studying bristlecone pines purportedly found trees that are older than that, but uh, he died actually before disclosing their locations. So a lot of other people actually do know of trees that are older than this tree here, so they're older than 5,000 years, which makes bristlecone pines the oldest non-clonal, i.e. sexually reproducing, organisms on Earth. Now, um, another thing about bristlecone pines is that 
their distribution is a little bit funky. So I'm going to take you to see a couple of other um, trees in California which are actually endemic. So they live in California and nowhere else. So um, the coast rubber trees are uh, only in California where their closest relatives are in China. And the giant redwood trees actually are in the Sierra Nevada, which is quite a ways from here. And I'm going to show you those next. But today we're in the Bristlecone Pine Forest. And the distribution of these guys actually extends all the way into the Great Basin and then all the way into Arizona. But it's still patchy. And believe it or not, there are websites that sort of track where these um, groves are because many of them, because they're really in high difficult to access locations, remain to be discovered. So they're really interesting trees. Um, uh, the last thing I'll tell you is that you're probably familiar with carbon-14 or radiocarbon dating. And when this was originally being performed, um, there was, it was noticed that there was some error in some of the measurements that were being done. Well, once bristlecone pine ages were discovered, one of the cool things that happened is um, scientists then came and used the cores in the bristlecone pines and because they have lots of carbon, they were able to actually better calibrate radiocarbon dating. And when they did this, they found out that most of the dates that were being estimated were about a thousand years too young. So bristlecone pine trees are also oftentimes referred to as trees that changed our understanding of history because historians and archeologists and anthropologists had to go back and change a lot of the stories that they had crafted around those earlier radiocarbon dates. All right, so I'm gonna take you through the rest of the grove and point out a few things along the way. I'm so glad you're here with me virtually and hopefully one day you'll get a chance to come visit it yourself. Here's a quick look at the road that we use to get up here. If you look out across, you can see a little bit of the grove. And of course, you can see the Sierra Nevada in the distance. And so you have to uh, drive up that really narrow road all the way up here to the Shulman Grove. Okay, folks, here's one of the really cool sections of the trail. You can see these incredibly gnarled, super old trees. If you look closely, you can see cones there on the ends of this tree. Remember that some of the needles on this tree can be older than 45 years. So this, these are really remarkable. This is a really remarkable section of this hike. And so I'll take you up here and give you a little bit better look. And of course, if I pan, not only will you see the trees, but way back in the distance are the Sierra Nevada. So I know you learned about rain shadows in Biz2B, and that's really where we are in the rain shadow region of the Sierra Nevada. We're still pretty high, so we're still in the white, white mountains. That's why you see the snow. But otherwise, a lot drier than the Sierra Nevada. So we're getting ready to walk down towards probably one of the most photographed trees in this whole grove. You can see that there's a pair of trees that are hugely twisted. So I'm going to take you down there and we're going to go have a look. I'll tilt you over to the left so you can get a quick snapshot of how that looks. I have to watch my footing here so I don't drop drop my camera. Sorry if things are a little shaky. But these are just truly remarkable trees. All right, folks, thank you very much for joining me on this interpretive walk of the Discovery Trail at the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest. I'm ending here with two of the most famous trees in the park. Both have a really interesting twist to them due to the extreme, due to the extreme weather up here. And next time I'm going to move on to some other conifers in California. We're going to move on to redwood trees. So make sure you stay tuned for our next trip. See you next time. In this lecture, we introduced the gymnosperms and discussed the shift in the role of spores and gametes in the seed plant life cycle. One thing I can recommend is taking a blank sheet of paper and reconstructing the drawing that I made in this lecture. We also talked about the diversity of gymnosperms with special emphasis on those that occur in California. If you have time, depending on where you live, I recommend going out and trying to find some examples of these. 
Gymnosperms occur broadly, especially conifers, and you should be able to find some near you. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet up with you in the Zoom office hours. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.